This morning, you are in one of three positions. You are either just coming out of a crisis, just going into a crisis, or you're in the middle of a crisis. That seems to be the pattern of life. And the challenge for us as believers in Christ is how do we sustain our faith in the middle of crises. In Acts chapter 27, the Apostle Paul faces another crisis. It's a crisis which he didn't really have to face because it appears from a human perspective he made a calculated mistake at the end of, or in Acts chapter 26, for the last verse of Acts 26, has Agrippa talking to Felix, who has imprisoned Paul, and Agrippa says to Felix, it's too bad that he appealed to Caesar because otherwise we could have set him free. And that catches us up because he's appealed to Caesar, and now they're going to go to Rome. And so he has been, um, he's being sent to Rome, and this is where we start in Acts chapter 27. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramitium, Adramitium, for those of you that are trying to say that, I did that a lot of times to try to get it right. And there's a bunch of other names in here I'm going to get wrong. Um, That's why you should follow along, because then you can say, ah, he pronounced that wrong. Uh, Anyway, they boarded a ship from someplace, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to Paul, what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called a northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cotta, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing that that we would run aground on sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood before them and said, Men, you should take should have taken my advice and not set sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, 
Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when the, about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that, let, that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lighted the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they, let them, they left them in the sea and in the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then we hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow, st- the bow struck, uh, stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners that, to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to save Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. This is the word of God. Father, as we look to this passage, we ask that you would speak a message to each of us individually. That we would understand why you've placed this in in your word for us today. Amen. Paul has gotten out of one bad situation. He's been released from the jail in Caesarea, but now he's in a ship that's going to have a shipwreck, and it gets worse because once they get on shore, we find out in the next chapter that Paul is gathering some firewood and gets bitten by a snake. That's from from the frying pan into the fire. That's leaving one crisis to enter another crisis. And through it all, God receives honor and glory. In your life, you are either coming out of going into or in the midst of a crisis. The question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we make it through crisis in a way which is God-honoring? And there are three lessons we're going to learn from Paul and his experience in Acts chapter 27, which I believe will help us in the midst of or in preparation for or looking back upon the crises in our life. The first lesson is simply this. We, the, the storms of life are not meant to be weathered alone. It's an interesting thing if you read through the, the, the Scriptures in the New Testament, in, in Paul's letters, in the letters that Peter and John write, and in Acts. One thing that keeps coming up is people's names. I'm particularly struck because there's a few names that come up in this passage, a guy named Julius, who is a centurion, um, and a guy named Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. You know, we don't know anything about, it, anything about Aristarchus. He just happened to be on that boat with Paul and a group of people in Sidon who, that, that the Scripture says were Paul's friends. And there's a reason that the Scripture mentions names. It is because people are important. And we are not meant to weather the storms of life alone. 
So Paul is on his journey, and of course we know that Luke is there because he, he speaks, you know, we were there and we did this. And so Luke is also a part of the people who are on the ship with Paul. And the lesson that, that we receive from this is that we are not meant to weather the storms of life alone. As a matter of fact, in this passage, you, see, you start off with being introduced to a centurion named Julius, and Julius is one who apparently took a liking to Paul. And there's a possibility that Julius later becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, but at the beginning, he takes a liking to Paul so that when they land in Sidon, that Julius, trying to be kind to Paul, lets him go and visit his friends, which is another interesting thing because we, there was no evidence before this that that Paul had been to Sidon, and yet he had friends there. And it's interesting, he showed up in this town, and he seeks out his friends in order that they would care for him. You don't get through the storms of life alone. Everyone needs someone else. And then the same Julius, later on at the end of the passage, he's a centurion who, when the rest of the people, the rest of the soldiers say, let's kill all the prisoners, he says, no, I'm going to spare the life of these prisoners because they're going to go to Rome then you don't get through the storms of life alone. The other individuals who come alongside it, and, and Scripture speaks to that when it so consistently talks about people by name. People we don't know anything else about, but they just happen to be named as people who are significant to helping the, the, the cause of the church of Jesus Christ. Just recently, a, a relatively famous comedian took his own life. One of the reasons he took his own life is because he didn't reach out to people at a time when he needed to. And I understand that depression can do terrible things to you, but the, the reality is that you don't make it through the storms of life alone. If, you, if you're alone, you tend to do stupid stuff. You don't make it through the storms of life alone. So for one, one of the lessons we have to take home from this is that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to come to a friend and say, you know what, I am struggling. I need some prayer support. I need you to check in on me. Can you just come and spend time with me? It's okay to say, I need a friend. It's okay to, to, to just express that you are hurting, that you're going through a storm in life right now. To have someone say, you know what, I'm praying for you. I, I think it's really, it's a cool thing from a pastoral perspective when I overhear someone talk to another person and say, you know what, you asked me to pray about such and such a thing, and I haven't talked to you for a couple of weeks. How is that going? I've been praying for you. you we are not alone. We, 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 we need to cultivate relationships because we're not meant to weather the storms of life alone. And when we try to weather the storms of life alone, bad things usually happen. The text mentions Julius, it mentions Aristarchus, it mentions 275 other people who are on that boat with Paul. And I, I like the, the, the lesson of, of the, the lifeboat, the lesson of a lifeboat in verses 30 to 32. That's where some of the soldiers, they decide, you know what, we'd be better off without these other 200 and some odd people. We're going to cut strings, we're going to go out on the lifeboat. And you think about that, you know, you could... You'd be in a heap of trouble if you were uh, part of the crew of a boat and you said, you know what, the, the ship's going down. We're taking the lifeboat. Um, but that's what these soldiers are going to do. And, and Paul says, you know, that's a bad idea. If we let them go, we're all going to suffer. And it's an interesting thing in the text because earlier on in the text when Paul said, you know, it's a bad idea for us to set sail, everybody ignored him. But here he says, don't let those guys go out on that lifeboat because if they go, we're all going to lose in this endeavor. And so they, they, they take a drastic action. They actually cut the ropes and let the lifeboat go. So they're all in it together. It's an incre incredible lesson for us that we are all in it together, that we are not meant to weather the storms of life alone. It is time for us to admit that we sometimes need help it's never a problem to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And don't be afraid to accept help. One of the things that we have as a church, every, every month we take a benevolence offering. That's, that's there in order for us to help one another. And sometimes you might give to benevolence and sometimes you might receive benevolence. But you know what? If we don't know you're struggling, we can't help. And sometimes... We, we can help enough to make a significant difference. 
Never be afraid to ask for help and never be afraid to accept help. And don't be too quick to go it alone. Because when you try to go it alone, bad things often happen. The first lesson of the storm is that the storms of life are not meant to be weathered alone. God has made us social beings. We gain support from one another. We, we help one another out. And that's part of the reason we get involved in Bible studies and care groups, because we have an avenue where we can get to know one another. We can find out what our needs are. It's one of the reasons why we connect to each other face-to-face instead of on Facebook. Because when you're, when you're on Facebook, you don't see the, the body language which comes from what somebody says. And, and quite honestly, on this might come as a surprise to you, but there's a lot of people on Facebook who just lie. They don't tell the truth. They, they, they don't give their real feelings. Oh, everything's going wonderful. I mean, think about that. If, if you're going to write something on the Internet, wouldn't you say everything's wonderful? You're not going to say, man, life really stinks. I'm going through a horrible storm in life. Some of you will, but you know, not the average bloke because we want to put on a good appearance. We want people to think that we're, everything's wonderful. And sometimes you do that in face-to-face relationships too. If you're not honest with one another in, in face-to-face relationships, it's likely you're going to end up weathering storms alone and you're not going to weather them well. The first lesson from the stone, storm is that storms are not meant to be weathered alone. Get yourself some friends. Get involved in adult Bible fellowship. Attend the cafe and sit around a table with people and, and talk to them and, and express, this is where my heart is. And this is, you know, build the kind of relationships so that when the storms of life come, and they will come, get, get the kind of relationships that you can pick up the phone and say, you know, I'm struggling. Can we just have coffee together? Can we pray together? Help me in the name of Jesus. That's the first lesson from the storm. The second lesson is kind of an interesting one. Because the storm is anticipated, and, and the, the, it's interesting. Someone told me after the first service I missed a, a really important thing, uh, and that is, um, it actually is in verse um, 13. A gentle wind began to blow. They thought they had obtained what they wanted. That is, oftentimes the storms of life begin with a beautiful day. Um, just for a side point, sometimes the storms of life begin with a beautiful day. However, they had a pretty good hint that maybe something was going to be going wrong because earlier in that, in verse 10 of the text, um, they decided by majority vote that they were going to sail on. But Paul had stood up and said, this is a really bad idea. I can tell you we're not, it's not going to end well. And so, so they took a vote. They were very democratic about it. They voted to go ahead and set sail. And then the storm came, which brings us to the point that sometimes the majority isn't right. The majority is not always right. Democracy works generally, but it works generally because this one principle which we often forget, and that is that there is no one who is set to rule over you except they are appointed by God. Uh, We'll get to this more later on, but the, the, the point that I saw in this is here's a group of people, 276 people, and maybe it was only 180. Five hundred eighty-six, there are eight, eight, 189 that voted in favor, so it was a split vote. But the, 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 the general idea is that most everybody decided to go with the sailor's perspective. You can just imagine it. Um, there's this guy who's a prisoner. You know, he's, he's a bad dude because he's, he's a prison, right? He, you don't get to prison because you're a good dude. And he's, uh, and, and he's a preacher, you know. And everybody knows that preachers are only good for one thing. That's to preach. They're not like good sailors. They're not like, you know, they don't know the weather. And so here's this preacher who's saying, you know, this is going to turn out badly. And all the sailors say, you know, we ought to go on. The owner of the ship says, we ought to go on. The, the, the pilot of the ship, we ought to go on. He said, we're going to go with the people that know something, not the, not the bozo preacher. I, I could just, I could see Paul saying, okay, I want to pull out the trump card. You know, the card says, Paul, apostle, friend of God. Uh, God speaks to me, you guys read the weather. Angels come to me, you guys throw stuff overboard. Uh, you know, your choice, but they say, we're going with the people that know something. Uh, maybe we got to go with the people that know God. Just a thought. Off the notes, but it's just a thought. Go with people that know God. Um, the majority votes and they, they sail on. And guess what? The majority was wrong. Paul knew they were wrong. And the interesting thing is that The majority got their way, and everybody paid a price. 
It's not like it's just the minority, majority that faced the storm, but even the minority faced the storm. It's an interesting thing that even when you know better, even when you know the majority is wrong, you still should speak up. You know, Paul could have said, yeah, that's whatever, okay. I, I can see the way this is going. I mean, I'll, I'm not going to speak up. I'm not going to risk my reputation. Sometimes we need to risk our reputation and speak from the minority perspective because the majority is not always right. And it comes back to haunt them. It comes back to haunt Paul. As a matter of fact, by the time you get to verse 20 in our text, it says they finally gave up all hope. We're going down this road. We're going to go together. We're going to give up all hope because no matter what we do, no matter what we try, the storms of life are too much for us. So the second point. Sometimes the majority makes the wrong decision. Don't be afraid to stand up as the minority when you stand up for Christ. And the third point. And the third point I really think is the most important take-home point for us today. And that is this, that God takes care of us even when we make bad decisions. I read, I read this text over and over this week, asking God to say, what, what is it, the message you want me to have here? And it turns out that we don't have to make all the right decisions all the time. Now, if you want to tweet something, that's a good thing to tweet. If you want to put it on Facebook, you can say, Pastor Steve said this morning, it turns out we don't have to make all the right decisions all the time. Look at what happened in Acts chapter 27. They made some bad decisions, but in the end, it turns out okay. A lot of us struggle with this idea that in life, we have to make the right decision all the time. If we don't make the perfect decision, then the other shoe's going to fall, and life is going to fall apart. But the reality is that we don't have to make the perfect decision every time. We can make some downright boneheaded decisions and God will still take care of us. Because God takes care of his own even when we make bad decisions. God takes care of his own even when the majority together decide to make a bad decision. Uh, You know, it's a good thing I'm not God. Because I'm, like, I'm thinking if I look down on this situation and the majority votes for, you know, let's sail on. I'm going, hey, you morons, you, you made that bed, you can sleep in it. You know, just let me know how that works out for you. Because I, I sent my prophet down there. I told him, you know, hey, Paul, tell everybody don't sail. And this is a test. Either they, they, they listen to the man of God or, you know what, I'm sending a northeaster on them. Just teach them a lesson. That's kind of the way we often think, isn't it? We've got to teach them a lesson. And God instead says, I'm going to send an angel now to talk to Paul and calm everybody's nerves. They're going to be a little hungry. They haven't eaten for 14 days. And that's a long storm. I mean, I don't want to be in a boat during a mild rain, much less a storm where they're throwing stuff overboard to, to keep the boat alive. You read that story and you go, they tied ropes around the boat so it wouldn't fall apart? Who's the guy that swam under the boat? You go, that, that guy's my hero, man. I, I can't, I'm down there. You go, wait a minute, but what kind of a life raft do you have for me? Because if you got me going underneath that boat, these people were scared silly. And God said, I got this take care of you. You made a really bad decision. All you people together, bad decision. You voted against my prophet, bad decision. But you know what? I'm not finished with Paul yet. I'm going to save all of you because I'm going to save Paul. It turns out we don't have to make all the right decisions all the time. And that ought to be liberating for us. It will liberate us to actually make decisions because sometimes what happens is we're so worried about making the right decision that we make no decision at all. We're so worried that we, we might say something wrong or, or make a, a little bit of a wrong turn and we're going to be lost. Well, here's an idea. Turn around if you get lost. Ask for directions. In the storms of life, God always takes care of his own. He always 
takes care of his own. God is always with us. Even when we're really stupid, God is with us. Even when the majority rules and the majority is dead wrong, God is with us. Even when we lose all hope, God is with us. Even when everything seems to be against us, when the storm has blown up so bad and it seems that nothing is going to work, God is with us. Even when we have done everything we can think of to do and it seems that everything we think of to do fails, when we've thrown all the cargo over, we've thrown all the grain over, and when we can't think of anything else to do, God is still with us. This is the assurance we have as believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm with you always. You know, Jesus didn't say, you know, I'm with you as long as the sun's shining. I'm with you as long as the weather's good. I'm with you as long as you only make smart decisions. God didn't say, you know, I'm, I'm going to stick with you as long as you continue to make the right decisions. God says he's with us even in the midst of our sin. He's willing to forgive us even in the midst of doing things which we know he doesn't want us to do. He still is with us. He still is offering forgiveness. We don't have to make all the right decisions all the time because God takes care of us. Even in the midst of sinful decisions, God still takes care of us. Honestly, most of the storms of your life aren't life and death questions. The storms of your life are whether you lost a whole bunch of money when the market crashed. And what are you going to do when you don't have as much money in your portfolio? Or maybe... You signed up for the wrong course, and you got a teacher that doesn't appreciate you. Most of the storms of our life aren't this dramatic. Some of them are. What's recorded in Acts chapter 27 of Paul and 275 others surviving a storm in the midst of a shipwreck doesn't always happen. Sometimes there's a shipwreck that ends with everyone dying. A plane crashes and there are no survivors. And here's the thing. God is still faithful even when we have a shipwreck which ends in death. God is still faithful even in the midst of catastrophes. He has promised He will be with us. He will take care of us. And He will take care of us until he sees us face to face. He will take care of us throughout all the storms of life. And I would submit that until our work on earth is done, we will survive every storm that comes our way. Until your work on earth is done, you will survive every storm that comes your way. Now that leads me to an interesting conclusion that I should make sure that I never quite finish the work God has for me? That I make sure I know what God wants me to do? That I know why I'm here? That I can say, yes, I am doing this. This is God's call upon my life. And I'm going to do this until he says my work is done. So either I do that, make sure my, of my own calling, my, make sure that I know what God wants me to do, or I need to make sure that I'm always close to somebody else who isn't done with their work. Because I'm thinking 275 people on board plus Paul. Paul was the guy, Luke was the guy. These two, those two guys had more work to do. Paul specifically was, had to go you know, have his trial before Caesar, and Luke had a little couple books he had to write. And, you know, so God wasn't done with those two guys. Those are two guys you could have stayed with, and the rest of them were saved because... God wanted to save those too. So either find out God's call for your life and make sure you're working at it and looking for what the next thing God wants you to do or stay next to somebody else who's faithful to God. Because God is going to take you through, you're going to survive any storm in your life until your work on earth is done. The storms of life, they're not meant to be weathered alone. And sometimes they're, they're caused by the majority Because the majority isn't always right. And no matter what storm that you face, no matter what difficulty comes your way, God has promised that he will be there, that he is with us. 
and he takes care of us, even when you make bad decisions. So loosen up. Make some decisions. Trust in God because he loves you with an incredible love, a love that says, I will with you, be with you always, even through the darkest storms of life. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us to understand your presence in the midst of the storms that we face in life. Help us to build relationships which will sustain us through the storms of life. And help us not to trust that the majority is always right, but to trust the Word, we, the word of God, to be willing to speak forth that which isn't popular, but which is, pri- but which is right. Now bless us today. May we have smooth sailing, but only if it allows us and motivates us to serve you well. In the name of Jesus.